Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. In a few minutes, Kathy will be reading John chapter 13, and we will be looking at the Gospel of John once again this morning. It's another one of those chapters where the words are easy and simple, but what John is talking about is kind of difficult. So it'll be uh, interesting as we look at the Gospel of John this morning. Next Sunday is our Thanksgiving service. And uh, Menchie has been putting together some videos that will be included. You still have one more chance that if you have something you want me to put into my very bad poem that I'm writing, and uh, we will have that next Sunday as well. You know, I have to say that I really miss the fellowship that we have together. Uh, most of you know that we at Emmanuel Baptist, uh, and when the service ends, in the old times, no one left. Uh, we all stood around and had coffee and talked and just enjoyed being with each other. I look forward to the day when we can do that again. Uh, right now, this makes sense, uh, doing our service online, limiting the number of people in the building, and uh, we won't be having our Thanksgiving uh, meal as uh, we normally do next Sunday. Steve is not able to come, but we'll look forward to that in the future want to say thank you to everyone that is sticking together as a church uh, during this COVID-19 uh, crisis. So anyways, that's next Sunday. Then the following Sunday, we'll be talking about John chapter 14, which is a perfect chapter for this corona crisis when Jesus says, do not be worried and upset. So, uh, well, I look forward to uh, a couple of weeks from today. And then three weeks from today, we'll be having the Lord's Supper. Now, what's exciting is that this week, our gluten-free little pre-filled capsules came, which I am told this is the first time that we are having a gluten-free option here at Emmanuel Baptist. Is that true? Yeah. So anyways, I, I have to say they're kind of neat. I haven't used one of these yet, but it's got the uh, like a little hourglass shape or like a chalice, whatever you want to call it. And on the one side is a little tiny wafer, and this side, of course, is the juice, and it uh, is gluten-free. I've put some out in front that if anyone wants to take along with them today, so you have it at home for an, uh, uh, three weeks from today, uh, they are available, and we'll again have them on the Sunday that we have Lord's Supper. As we begin, let's talk to our great God in prayer this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your protection, for your love. Thank you, Lord, that you are always present with us. Thank you, Lord, that you are the light of the world and that whoever follows you will always walk in light. We thank you, Lord, that your love is never-ending, is constant, and that we have good news to talk about today because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and he arose again on the third day as victor over sin and victor over death. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Grace of God has reached for me.
Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from John 13. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, 
nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was nice night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, Where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. The best television program that I have seen so far here in the Netherlands is The Passion. The Passion is what I would describe as a rock opera about the final days of the ministry of Jesus, his betrayal, the cross, and the resurrection. It is very well done. The producers make the very most out of the local setting. It's always done outdoors. Uh, it's always done on Monday, Thursday. That's the Thursday right before Easter. I got to know The Passion when I was living up north. Uh, in uh, going to school in Groningen uh, back in 2014. Every day I would walk from the Groningen main station through the Wismark to the university. And I watched as they built the uh, stage and installed the lights and prepared for the production. The evening of the performance, it was raining. 
And so I decided to stay home and watch it on television, which is probably a good idea because they say 20,000 people tried to fill the Vismark that night, which was way too many. The uh, overflow had to watch on a large screen in the Grotemark, which uh, Rupert, Lena, you'll know exactly where that's located. Um, there's so many good things to say about the Passion. They do so many things well. But one thing that the Passion has caused is for me to like Judas Iscariot. How many people like Judas? Yeah, I looked at uh, online, to, uh, you know, people just don't name their children Judas anymore. I looked online for popular names for baby boys, and this is for 2018. And the number one highest name was Alexander. So Hazel and uh, Robert, you did a good job. And then they list all the other names. Judas is number 5,379. Uh, according to another website, uh, in Spain, it is against the law to name someone Judas. I don't know if that's true or not, but it proves that Judas is just not a popular name because of what he did. Well, in the Passion, uh, this is back in 2017, Van Velzen, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, he's a famous uh, Dutch musician, uh, played the part of Judas, and it was incredible. They had him standing on the edge of the roof of the Fries Museum. Uh, this is in Leeuwarden on the Wilhelmina Plain. And the, the Fries Museum, I believe, is five stories high, and it has a roof that projects out quite a ways that's held up by these slender, thin columns. And they had him standing on the very edge of that roof singing about his disappointment in Jesus. How that passed health and safety, I, I don't know. Well, then, uh, to, uh, be a year ago, in uh, 2019, Lucas Hamming played the part of Judas. He is a uh, famous Dutch rock artist, and he got it right. He got all the little innuendos, all the little gestures that show how he becomes more and more disappointed with Jesus as the program goes along. Uh, this is in uh, Dordrecht, and as they arrive on the water bus, Judas shows Jesus and the disciples they should go this way, and Jesus goes that way. They go to an ice skating rink, and Judas tells two small boys to move so that he and Jesus can sit down. And uh, instead, Jesus kneels down and ties the skates of one of the little boys. And you can just see th during the program how Judas is becoming more and more frustrated and finally gives up on Jesus, and he betrays him. You know, Judas is a disciple, but he misses an important lesson. Discipleship, following Jesus, is not about what we get from God. Discipleship is following Jesus no matter what, good times or bad times. Discipleship is being like Thomas. We talked about Thomas a couple of weeks ago. Thomas never gives up on Jesus. He is willing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere. In fact, this is a theme that we see through these three chapters here in John. Two weeks ago, you heard me quote to the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Bonhoeffer says that the call of Jesus is this, come and die. Come and die to your own plans, your own hopes, your own expectations, and follow him every day. Then last Sunday, you heard Jesus say this to us, those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am and my father will honor anyone who serves me. Well, Jesus gives us the ultimate example. In a couple of weeks, we will be reading about the crucifixion as he gives his life for our salvation. Today in our Bible text, Jesus says this to us, I am telling you the truth. No slaves are greater than their master, and no messengers are greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know this truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice. Following Jesus means serving others. Not getting, but giving. 
and Judas misses this message. Judas is only looking for what he can get out of following Jesus. John tells us more about Judas than the other uh, Gospels. And from what we see about Judas here in the Gospel of John, Judas is intelligent, he's motivated, he's ambitious, he has high expectations. Many of you, I think probably most of us, have heard this before, either in a Bible study or maybe in a sermon. Um, it's called the uh, Resumes of the Apostles. And as far as I can tell, it was uh, first written by an author that I really like, Tim Hansel. This is from his 1988 book, uh, Eating Problems for Breakfast. And it's humorous. It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be a report that is given to Jesus about each of the disciples. And this is what Tim Hansel writes. It is the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus definitely have radical leanings. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your right-hand man. Now, what Tim Hansel writes is humorous, but he makes a point that Judas starts off as a highly regarded disciple, as much as any of the other disciples. You probably noticed in our Bible text this morning that none of the other disciples suspect Judas. None of the other disciples think that Judas is going to do anything wrong. When Jesus gives the piece of bread to Judas, showing that Jesus knows that he is about to betray him, none of the other disciples think that anything is wrong. Again, verse 27. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, hurry and do what you must. None of the others at the table understood why Jesus said to the, uh, this to him. Since Judas was in charge of the money bag, some of the disciples thought that Jesus had told them to go and buy what they needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. In the beginning, Judas likes Jesus. He really does. And Judas realizes that this is something really big. Jesus is really going to go someplace. And he's hearing about this kingdom that Jesus is going to establish. Judas thinks this is going to turn out good for Judas. We know that Judas is one of the disciples that Jesus sends out to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Judas goes out, preaches that the kingdom of God has arrived in Jesus. Now we can speculate because most people back then expected a Messiah who was going to be a political king. A king who would remove the Roman occupiers and make Israel independent once again, a strong independent nation. That was just a common belief about the Messiah. And since Judas is part of this inner circle with Jesus, he could expect to get some kind of reward. Maybe he's going to become treasurer of the new kingdom or certainly some high position where he can make a lot of money. Now, I like Judas, but Judas has some flaws. He could have done well, but he has some shortcomings. He's selfish, self-centered, he's a thief, and he's a, tra a traitor. John tells us that Judas is the treasure for Jesus and the disciples. It's his job to take care of the money that they are using for their ministry. We heard this uh, when Carmen read in uh, chapter 12 last Sunday. Jesus arrives at the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and uh, Mary takes a very large jar of a very expensive perfume, and she puts this expensive perfume on the feet of Jesus and then takes her hair and wipes his feet. 
which is a symbol of absolute humility. And John tells us that one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, the one who's going to betray him, said, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would help himself from it. Judas is a person who wants to take care of Judas. So he steals. Why do people steal? I was a manager of a, in a large department store, it's called Shopco, and uh, we had a very bright young man who was uh, working in our electronics department, and uh, very promising, uh, he was in university and working on his degree, and I had noticed that uh, uh, that register in the electronics department had been coming up short uh, for several days uh, quite often. As you might expect, the electronics department has its own cash register. There's a lot of expensive items that are for sale there, and so this store required uh, shoppers to pay for their electronics items before they left. Well, one day the store security uh, came to me and showed me a video of the surveillance camera of the electronics department, and the young man took some money out of the register and put it into his pocket. And it wasn't just the one time, there was many, many, many times on the camera that uh, he had been caught taking money. So I called him to my office and uh, we showed the video to him, he confessed to everything, he admitted that he was the one who was taking the money. And it was so sad to see him led away by the police to be charged as a thief for stealing. Why do people steal? Well, Judas could have had so much, but he was a thief. In the beginning, he started off doing good, but he doesn't end well. Judas expects a reward. He expects to get something from following Jesus. And especially now, we have just seen the triumphal entry. Jesus enters Jerusalem as the promised Messiah, and the crowds think they are about to get this political king. And Judas no doubt expects that now finally, Jesus is going to become this important political person that Judas wants him to be, and to begin to act like a king. But instead, Jesus keeps making the wrong decisions, at least in Judas's opinion. What Jesus does is all wrong. John tells us that even before the Last Supper, Satan had put the thought into the mind of Judas to betray Jesus. We saw that in the second verse. Jesus and his disciples were at supper. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, the thought of betraying Jesus. The disappointment, the frustration that Judas is feeling towards Jesus is building, building to a breaking point, building to a point where he's almost going to take action. And now at the Last Supper, that comes. The breaking point for Judas is servant leadership. We all know, Judas would say, Judas would say, we all know that the king has others serve him. The king does not serve other people. Story about this. The Fairmont Hotel Empress in Victoria, the capital of British Columbia, is a huge, grand, magnificent old hotel uh, built in 1908. It just dominates the uh, inner harbor area of uh, Victoria and uh, 477 guest rooms. It's a, it's a big hotel. Now, uh, when I went to the Empress, I arrived with one suitcase and a backpack. The king of, and queen of Siam, which is a country that we now know as Thailand, when they visited in 1930, they arrived with 56 servants and 556 pieces of luggage which is still a record. But that's how a real king and queen travel. They have others that serve them. Jesus says the greatest person is the one who serves other people. In the clearest possible example, Jesus takes off his cloak, that outer garment, puts a towel around his waist, and kneels down and begins to wash the feet 
of the disciples. This is what the lowest servant had to do. Verse 12, after Jesus had washed their feet, he put his outer garment back on and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I have just done to you? He asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and it is right that you do so, because that is what I am. I, your Lord and teacher, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you so that you will do just what I have done for you. I'm telling you the truth, no slaves are greater than their master, and no messengers are greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know this truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice. Judas must have been appalled. Judas is expecting a reward. He's expecting Jesus to become the king, and that he, Judas, is now going to become someone important in this kingdom. He's going to benefit. He's looking to see what he can get from Jesus. Judas is not interested in servant leadership. And he's not willing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere. He only wants to get. Jesus says that the man that he gives the bread to is the man who's going to betray him. The saddest verse in this chapter is verse 30. Judas accepted the bread and went out at once. It was night. It was night. This is more than just John's comment on what time of day it is. John is telling us about what it's like in Judas's heart. Jesus said that he is the light of the world. Remember? Remember back when we studied chapter 7 of John? Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life and will never walk in darkness. And now here in chapter 13, Judas turns away from following Jesus. He turns away from the light of the world, and he goes out into the darkness. It was night. Who are you going to follow? Do you want to be like Thomas, the man who would not quit, the man who's willing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere? Jesus stay, uh, Thomas stay, stays true to Jesus, the light of the world. Or do you want to be like Judas? Judas gives up on Jesus, follows Satan, and goes out into the night. Your choice. Because of what Judas does, his name is not very popular. In fact, it's pretty well hated. South St. Paul, Minnesota in the U.S. used to have the largest meatpacking factories in the world. The three largest meatpacking plants in the world. It, it's all gone now, but back in the day, about 60 years ago, you had uh, Swift & Company, you had Armour and Hormel, the three largest meatpacking factories in the world. And to supply the animals, there was the largest stockyard in the world because thousands of animals had to be taken to each factory every day. Cattle, pigs, and sheep. Now, sheep don't move very well. If you've ever tried to move sheep, it's difficult, even on the best of days. And if sheep don't want to go somewhere, you are in for a tough rodeo of trying to get those sheep to go where you want them to go. Well, the stockyards in South St. Paul solved this by training a goat. And they trained a goat to go from the sheep pen up the ramp and across the wooden walkway and into the meatpacking factory. And so what they did when they wanted to move sheep, they would put the goat in with the sheep, they would open the door of the pen, the goat would go walking up the ramp and onto the walkway, and all the sheep would follow the goat and go up the ramp, and as the goat came into the killing floor of the meatpacking factory, someone would grab him and take him back to his pen, and all of the sheep would keep walking in to die. They gave the goat a name. Any guesses as to what name they gave the goat? Judas. Judas the goat. Judas is a traitor. He's a thief. He's a loser. 
Judas wants to get as much as he can from Jesus, he, and he loses everything. Thomas, a man who is willing to give up everything to follow Jesus, he is the hero at the end of this book, the star. Thomas wins. Who are you going to follow? Join me in prayer. Lord, it's amazing to see that a disciple that started off so well would be the one that would betray you and would end so poorly. Lord God, keep us faithful to you. Allow us, Lord, to follow the example of Thomas and to be able to say that wherever you go, whether it involves difficulty, suffering, or if it involves getting things from you, whatever, that we will follow you no matter what. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Tomorrow is a big day for me. I need to go up to Den Bosch. I would ask that you would pray uh, for my safety and well-being uh, because I have stayed off of public transport since the corona crisis began. I, I'm thrilled. I'm going up to get my new visa. So it's an exciting thing. I, I need to go up there. Uh, but uh, I've had pneumonia five times. I'm at a very high risk uh, for the corona. So if you'd pray for my safety as I travel tomorrow to then Bosch. I have to mention that we've had a couple of IT issues. Uh, if you've not received an email from me or if you sent one and didn't get an answer, uh, we've got some things that are not communicating quite right. But thankfully, we have Barry who understands all of this, and uh, we're going to work, work that out. I just want to mention that um, this morning um, there is a, uh, a, an article on the BBC News website, and it's the letter of, uh, written by a Baptist pastor on the Titanic. Uh, it was his last letter that he wrote uh, on the Titanic stationery. It sold for 42,000 British pounds yesterday. But it's interesting. It was written by John Harper, a British pastor, uh, who was going to America to preach in Moody Church. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, of course, I attended Moody Church when I went to Moody Bible Institute, so I know it's a huge church. It seats thousands of people, and that's where he was going. But it's interesting to read about the man because uh, he turned down a place in the lifeboat next to his daughter, and then he took his li own life jacket off and gave it to someone else, and that person did survive. And the last they saw of John Harper, he was preaching the gospel as the uh, ship, uh, the Titanic was going down. So it's, it, you want to read his letter, and if you'd like to uh, read more about the man, uh, it's interesting on the website. Hopefully my train trip and the Titanic didn't go together. I didn't mean to put those stories together. But anyways, as we close, let's stand and uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Again, Lord, we say thank you that we have the freedom and liberty to worship you and to praise you. We also have the liberty, Lord, to follow you. As we've seen now for three weeks, allow us to be faithful followers of you. Let us be willing to lose our life, knowing that if we do so, we have the promise of eternal life and eternal rewards with you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.